to be here at uh, Japan Oil, Gas, and Metals National Corporation in Tokyo. <laughs> it's a long title, but very nice. So what I'm talking about today is a very brief overview of a short course that I'll be giving at China University of Petroleum in June of this year. It's a one-day short course, the title Carbonate Geophysics Pores to Prospect. And I've just pulled a few slides out today to illustrate the scope of that class. Because my research has more and more evolved toward carbonate geophysics from my time at Saudi Aramco and then the University of Houston working with CO2 sequestration and carbonates, now at the University of Arkansas where we're working on Mississippian carbonates and outcrop wireline and 3D seismic. So this very colorful diagram is my way to get across the thought that carbonates are very complex. And this, you all know this is the Mandelbrot set. And so we have, in various aspects of the, of the subject, like geology, pores, rock physics, there is complexity at those levels, and when you put the whole thing together, though, it does start to make a coherent picture like we see here. So this is sort of my cartoon to get that across. So let's talk first about geology. We'll just go in the order uh, that those subjects were up there. So the reason to think about carbonates at all is, in this slide, that something like half of the world's oil reserves between 50 and 60 percent is in carbonate reservoirs, primarily in the Middle East, but also other places all over the world. And I'm sure that JOGMEC is working on carbonates in various basins around the world. What we call shale, in many cases, is a self-sourced carbonate. You can have up to 50 or 60 percent of the rock be calcite, and we still might call it a shale in terms of oil and gas production. So one thing associated with geology is the classification of carbonates. Dunham's classification scheme is pretty much universally used. It has these strange terms like mudstone, waxstone, pachystone, etc. The ones we really want to pay attention to, the best reservoir case is the grainstone right in here, which lacks mud and is a grain-supported rock. The original components are not bound together during deposition. They are they're loose, separated grains and the depositional texture is still recognizable when you see the rock much later. And over here on the right, we see that a grainstone can have uh, up to 25 or so percent porosity, maybe more, and in this case up to 2,000 millidarcies, very high permeability. Okay. On the other end of the spectrum, we have mudstone, which is a very fine kind of uh, calcitic mud, and the porosity although it can be quite high, the permeability is extremely low. And this can act as a barrier, a permeability barrier within the carbonate sequence that compartmentalize the carbonate. There are many carbonates active in the world today. This shows the Bahama platform. And we see things like the islands up there. We see the beaches where we would have wave action dominating. And we also see the tidal channels where material is carried away from the point of deposition, so we have transported sediment. So in terms of limestones, we have not only the fact that the, con the limestone forms, the carbonate forms in place, unlike clastics, which are transported sediments, it forms in place, but we do have transport mechanisms that can give us many flow features as well. Two very common descriptions of Carbonates are either a carbonate ramp, shown here, or a carbonate reef shelf, where we have alternating layers of reef deposits, back reef deposits, and often up on the shore side of this whole operation, we have starved basins and other uh, objects which give us anhydrite development, which can in turn become the ultimate cap rock for a carbonate sequence, an anhydrite cap. For example, the Gawar field in Saudi Arabia, the Hith anhydrite is the, uh, is the seal for the Arab D reservoir throughout Saudi Arabia. So let's talk just a little bit about the pores. 
because carbonate rocks are soluble, there are many possibilities for pore space. They're named here, and most of them are self-explanatory. Moldic might be kind of a strange term, but the way to think about that is that we had an original uh, fragment, usually of a shell, deposited, and then later in the process of the rock's diagenesis, the shell itself was dissolved away, leaving a gap or a mold of the fossil. And so you get moldic porosity. Notice it's broken here into primary porosity, which is sort of early on, and then we have secondary porosity caused by diagenetic uh, changes due to later fluid flow through the limestone, up to vugs and caverns. So diagenesis is the process, the word we use to describe what happens to the rock after deposition, what happens to the pores. In this diagram, we start in the upper right, we have deposition, we have compaction, and then we go down to more compaction on the lower left corner, and then at that point, things can start to change. We can, for example, go from this point to a fractured environment, or we can go from this point up to where we have dissolution. We can either leach out the cement, giving pore space between grains, or we can leach out the grains, giving moldic porosity. All these things are possible in any combination. One of the key features about carbonates is that they are soluble and that they are they can be dissolved to form large cave system, karst topography. This is a very nice diagram that shows many features of a karst topography. So when we're dealing with limestones around the world, we often are looking at a paleo-karst landscape, which can be extremely complex and on seismic scale, hard to figure out what's going on. Karst is common in the world today. These are karst regions in the U.S., so there's many places to understand how karst works in the modern world, so that it'll lead us as a guidebook toward understanding ancient karst. So let's talk a little bit about rock physics. This is a diagram from some Exxon authors showing a unified carbonate rock physics approach where we have two basic components, either calcite or dolomite or some combination of the two, plus clay particles, which may happen in some carbonates initially, but also may be introduced later. And that forms the solid rock. And from that, we have also porosity development, molded porosity, inner particle. We have wet clay pores. We have cracks. And then we have fluids. And you can see the way this works is they start out with a solid rock, and they describe that using the mixing of the Ross voigt hill average. And then they use Gassman theory to describe the fluid saturation effects. And there are several differential effective media theory, including Kuster and Toxos, that can deal with fractures and how fractures affect the rock properties. One issue that comes up is how well does Gassman describe uh, fluid substitution in carbonates? And this is taken from a very recent book called Petroacoustics. This book is online, is available uh, for download. And it shows across the horizontal axis the VP as measured in laboratory experiments, and on the vertical axis VP as estimated uh, from Gassman theory. The red and the pink symbols represent carbonates, and you can see that it's really a very good fit. The general thought now is that Gassman is accurate, at least as accurate as our experimental methods in the lab. So we feel like the weak link in this is not Gassman's theory applied to carbonates. So let's talk a little bit about wireline. This is a venerable template taken from the Agile Geoscience log. Uh, the, uh, it's called an Odegaard Avseth cross plot from, taken from first break 2004. Vertical axis is the VPVS ratio, which is the lithology indicator. Horizontal axis is the reservoir quality indicator, the P impedance. Now this thing is developed, as you see, we've got sandstones across here, including gas effects as we go down these colors. Across here we have porosity effects this way. And we also have uh, shale up here, shale as we get increasing porosity on the shale. 
And we've got the idea of very simple pores on the left of the diagram becoming more complex on the right, but also as we move to the right of the diagram, we get more and more dominance of the cement. So this has a lot of different things going on, and you see these different directions shown here and described there in this space. So this space is very useful in clastics. It was developed initially for clastics, and part of the work I've been doing is to try and extend this to carbonates. So short answer, the result of my work has been to get the diagram this way. All of the all of the material down here associated with sandstones is really just a redrawing of the uh, previous diagram. And the shale is also just carried over. But now we've got limestone starting at 0% uh, porosity or very close to it, 5, 10, 15% porosity. So the trajectory for limestone in this space is to go up left as we get more and more porosity. And that sort of parallels the up left we get from sandstone and shale. The dolomite has an opposite behavior. As you increase porosity, it goes down left. And notice that this is on an absolute scale now. We've actually not just had a, a cartoon. This is calibrated to real numbers using um, various mechanisms I can't really go into here. But for example, the limestone numbers here are taken from the Mavco's book on the Rock Physics Handbook, where he gives regression relationships on limestones and dolomites versus porosity from samples taken all over the world. So that gets us started on this diet, the, these two trajectories here. So let's just see what it actually does. Here's some real data from a well in southeast Kansas in the same space taken from full wave sonic log data and density. It's color coded by gamma ray so that we have the blue gamma down here represents low gamma numbers, bicarbonates, and as you get into this sort of uh, green color in the middle, these would be intermediate gamma, so sandstones, and then finally shales when you get above about 100. So we can see the shale trend, we see carbonates over here. So let's put the template on there and just see how well it fits. Here we go. So what we see in this particular area we know it to be an area that it's not gas prone, it's oil prone and brine, so there's not a lot going on down here, although we do have some data points, but those are likely lithological and not uh, due to fluids. You notice that two of these directions in here are now associated with carbonates. Direction 3B is porosity in dolomite, going this way, and direction 5, in addition to being gas saturated saturation in sandstone, which is down this way, that also represents the effect of chert in the limestone. So we've got the limestone line up here, and then if we, as we head down here, we have very low gamma. These are, in fact, carbonates that have chert. They're not sandstones. They're chert-rich carbonates. So this, and also there's very little dolomite in this particular well, so we have, these points are not visited up here. These are the limestones, and they're also quite tight. We don't have much high porosity limestone. Here's another well, about 30 miles away. So you can see that there's an effect in here that this template lets us helps us analyze. And of course, the real value of the template would be when we do elastic inversion, that we could then, from seismic data, cross plot the points and find places that are relatively chert rich and relatively chert free in our carbonate uh, depending on what we tried to do and what we tried to produce from. 